Today, on the first episode of season two of the Modern Musicking Show, we're actually on a road trip to do a deep dive that you'll see later this, uh, this season. But we have a profile of Leontine Price. You're going to hear from the Wind Ensemble from Carnegie Mellon University. You're going to uh, get to meet Megan Grady, who is the head of admissions for the School of Music. So if any of you who are thinking about going into music, you're going to want to uh, pay attention to her talk. So hopefully I won't uh, get into a wreck or get a ticket. Hey, slow down. Hey, slow down. There's no need for that sort of behavior. We hope you enjoy it. Thanks for checking out the Modern Musicking Show. Today on Jacob Random Holmes, featuring Jacob Randall Holmes. Jacob, would you? I'm a Virgo. Could you play me a song that's you know appropriate for a Virgo? Could you elaborate more? I was born in September. All right, today we are going to have a nice little conversation with Megan Grady, who is the, well, I'm going to let you explain who you are, one of the most important roles here at Carnegie Mellon in the School of Music and at any School of Music. So you're going to learn a huge amount of very useful information if you're thinking about going to school. So Megan, your title is? Director of Recruitment and Enrollment in the School of Music at Carnegie Mellon University. See, I told you. Okay, so Big what does that all mean? You're like, if I want to go to school, then I'm going to... Yeah, interface need to with talk you at to some me point. Eventually, somehow. <laughs> somehow. And so what's a, a typical sort of year in the life of Megan Grady look like in terms of the job itself? I do work full year round, so that's fun in August. Faculty ask how my summer off was and I chuckle and say it was great. I just did spreadsheets the whole time. Um, but my year really kicks off in August. We open our application on August 15, um, and that's also when Carnegie Mellon opens their Common App for the undergraduates. And then through the months of September, October, and November, myself and my colleague Kate Heston, Associate Director for Music Admission, we are both traveling on the road to various locations, California, New England, the D.C. area, Chicago, Florida, Texas, Michigan, all over the place. And we're meeting students at music college fairs, and general college fairs, at their high schools, at their youth ensemble rehearsals, kind of a whole smattering of different events. Then we come back to the office a couple weeks before Thanksgiving, hunker down, wait for the December 1 deadline, phones ring off the hook, emails are off the chain, but we're here for it, we're ready. That's our big deadline is December 1, and then we make a hard shift into audition season. So the month of December is working through pre-screening applications with faculty for the areas that are involved in pre-screening, and then we take our winter break, don't talk to me over that week, I'll come back and talk to you on January 2nd, and then we are doing auditions throughout the end of January through the month of February, 
Then we wrap all that up. I chase faculty down, Kate chased faculty down to get audition decisions. I compile all of those. On the graduate side, I'm finalizing those decisions here. For undergraduates, I'm working with admission to make sure that our decisions are matching up. And then we move into March, I start releasing decisions, graduate students first, um, and AMS, I should say. And AMS stands for? Advanced Music Studies Certificate. Okay. Um, so I release those in mid-March, end of March, first year students are getting their preliminary music decision. April 1 is when the university says to undergraduates, you're in, or maybe not as good of news, but we hope for the you're in <laughs> portion of that. And then at the end, uh, and then they have until May 1 to decide. Graduate students have till mid-April to let us know. So April is just always kind of a blur of a lot of emailing, a lot of phone calls, a lot of visitors in the office. That's also when we're starting to see juniors for the first time exploring college mixed in with admitted students graduate students, our own students freaking out about recitals and graduating themselves. It's a whole cacophony of excitement, and then May 1 hits and it gets pretty quiet around here again, and then I hunker down and start to prepare for the next year. Well, and you, you alluded to music festivals, so your summer, you don't really get a summer off. What do you do over the summer? That is true. Uh, Kate and I both do a little bit of light travel in the summer. We're typically at um, Aspen Music Festival, Brevard Music Center does a college fair as part of their festival. Uh, we're at Metamount up in New York. We're at Interlock, and of course, to visit their summer academy. And then um, occasionally we're at various other events, depending on who's hosting events, or if we have faculty there, then we usually go and support and do a visit. So you mentioned pre-screening. What is, what is pre-screening? Pre-screening is for um, a few of our areas. So voice, flute, violin, piano, composition, and music technology. I think that's all of them. Um, might be wrong, check our website. <laughs> the website knows more than me. Um, but those are areas where students have to do kind of a mini audition in preparation to be invited to an actual live audition either on campus or one of our regionals or if they're international, a secondary recorded audition. It's a little bit of a weirder situation. Um, but pre-screening is a way for our faculty to get a sense of who they are and what they sound like or what their interest is or look at their materials for composition and music tech before deciding um, whether or not they should continue through the application process. That way we're making sure that it's the right investment for both the student and our faculty to be going through the full audition and portfolio process. Um, because if it's not going to be a match, that's better to know that earlier on in these areas that are in high demand. How uh, important is it for the student to visit campus? It is usually pretty crucial in helping to make that final decision. So we do see a lot of students over the summer. Um, we see a lot of juniors spring break of their junior year, which is of course right when seniors are making decisions. So it's utter chaos, but it's a lot of fun. Um, and then we have a lot of students who maybe haven't had that chance to visit and they are waiting until they're admitted before um, deciding that they'll make the time and, and invest in coming to visit. So if you can, you should, but it's not the end of the world. It's not the end of the world, um, but definitely preferred for you to visit That's campus true. and be on campus before you arrive. Right. Because then the worst case is you hate it and then you want to transfer and then that's a big waste know. of money. Right. So, right. so you have to play that which one is a better dis uh, financial investment to help decisions. That makes perfect sense. Mm -hmm. So in terms of I want to help my student be successful yeah. um, through this process, what can I do? What's the care and feeding of a potential music student as um, a parent? It's really important to have a private teacher if that's available to a family. That's obviously a huge connection that helps guide a lot of students through their college decision making process. Um, and then that person often says, okay, here are the schools that I think might be a good fit for you based on your interest, your playing ability, or singing ability, um, and let's start to build this list and get you connected with these people. And there's a lot of great resources um, available both online and in print for families who are looking. So one of my favorite websites that I point families to for information about not only looking at different types of music programs across the country, but also looking at a bunch of other resources that go into deciding, and they also, I believe, have summer programs on there, is um, a, a website called majoringinmusic.com. Very easy name. Um, the, the woman who runs it, Barb, is fantastic. She's very easy to talk to. 
They have a wealth of resources about a variety of different types of music schools. You can, you know, get on the U.S. map and pick which area you want to be in. You can pick whether you want conservatory schools and music departments, whatever. Um, and then it has, it kind of condenses what's on everybody's websites down to a few key bullet points that are of most interest and then you can just request more information through that site. And then my current favorite resource that I want everybody in the world to know about is this book called College Prep for Musicians. And it's written by three authors, um, and one of the authors, Annie Bossler, DMA, is an alum of Carnegie Mellon, actually. She's great. Yeah. She did her undergraduate here, so a little plug for us. Um, but uh, the other two authors, one is like a life coach, and then Kathleen Tessar is the dean or executive something at uh, Juilliard, so obviously knows her stuff, most recently came from USC. But this is a resource that I'm pointing all families I know to. It's everything that any college music admission counselor wants a family to know. So it talks through from that very beginning stage where parents start asking questions, students start asking questions, all the way up through going through all the application, how to prep for auditions, how to build a panel to do practice auditions, how to sleep well, eat well, all of that. Um, up until when you're deciding and what questions to ask, how to talk about hmm. financial aid, how to kind of rate and rank schools based on your own personal feelings and talking through all those processes. And then down to how to practice the summer before you're actually on campus, which is very crucial and people don't think about that. <laughs> They're like, yay, I got in, I don't have to practice till I'm there. Um, not an advised mistake to right. make. Um, so it's a really wonderful resource and it's very easy. It has charts, it has check, check boxes, tells you how to build your audition binder, just all sorts of things. You can see I flagged it, yeah. highlighted it, tore it apart essentially. Um, but it's pretty, it's pretty easy to read. It's not super dense and I think it's a wonderful resource that families should be using. And then my big reminder for everybody are that you always want to plan ahead. Oh start reaching out to the faculty now, build relationships and all of those sorts of things. And then the secondary warning that deadlines are closer than they appear and you absolutely don't want to miss them because then there's not a lot I can do for you. Well, thank you very much for your time. Yes. Megan Grady, come to the School of Music and you get to meet her. Hopefully, yeah. yeah. We hope. That's the goal. Yeah. Except September, October, November, probably That'll be not harder. Yeah. yeah, get on a plane. See you in December. See you in December. <laughs> Thanks again. Thank you. See you. And now on Lance Learns to Play, Hannah Senef is going to teach me to play the oboe. I guess more accurately today, you're going to teach me to assemble an oboe. Correct. Is that right? Okay, yeah. so we're going to open the case. We're going to open the case. I might turn mine so you can see. All right, so what, what, are, the, what are these parts? This All right, is... so the oboe, it looks fairly simple. It uh -huh. only has three pieces. This one's the bell, the upper joint, and the lower joint. Okay, what's this? This should have something called mink oil in it, and this one is empty. And mink oil would be used around the corks of the oboe. Right I see. Here. So there's cork uh, around where each the places joint to connect. Hold them together. I see. Okay. And I think we might need to use some that I have on that oboe. Okay. So this is just a little protective cover? It sure is. And this is the yeah. upper joint? That's the upper joint. Okay. And we'll so just, we're going to take some of the mink oil. Just a little, yeah. And wipe it around the cork. All right. That's good. Let me check this one. Yeah, that one needs a little bit too. Okay. All right. Okay. So just a little oil. Just a little bit. And this is, well, this is a... That's like a, um, cork grease, but it will actually dry out these corks. Okay, so it the mink oil is better for Yeah, it's this. better for okay. actually helping to put it together. And so then, now what? We're going to start with the lower joint the uh, and the And bell. I have the lower you joint, You have the yes. lower joint. And the bell. And if you hold it in your left hand and wrap your hands kind of across the key work, right there, that's good. Okay. You can take the bell. The bell... Push it on and then twist it. Okay, so ultimately I want... It's going to line up right above this little tenon. Okay, so this, what's this called? This is just part of the tenon joint. So this is going to line up over the top mm -hmm. of that. That okay. way it connects and you can play the low notes. But I will um, put it here and then turn. Yes. Yeah, okay. Okay, and then and my before... Elbow pop, which is kind of <laughs> before you turn it, make Oops. sure... You lift it up, but don't oh, push too hard so you don't bend the keys. 
I see. That way it'll go right over top. Oh, okay. So yeah, if perfect. I hadn't done that, then they this would, would run into it. Okay, mm -hmm. we don't want that because it's not my elbow. That's correct. And actually, I once bent off a tenon joint. Oh, really? Joint. That's yeah, not so when good. I started, I was about 10. And then what happened? You got to take it to the shop. I had to get them to solder it back on. Oh, my gosh. Okay. And then now we want the upper. Yeah, you can actually. Yeah, in your right hand, you have it good. All right. And this time, you'll hold it kind of down here. Okay. That's good. Yeah. And then this one, you'll hold on the key work. On the key work. Actually, let's alter that. Hold it up here at the top. Okay, up towards the top. And then do I have to, am I doing something similar this no, time? No, see, this time, you can see on mine, they are raised up. And what's this? That is just protecting the thumb rest. Oh, okay. I see. So this is the that thumb one, rest. That's the thumb rest, and this one is not protected with a uh -huh. little gummy thing. Oh. Protects your thumb. Protects your thumb. And then there's a little gizmo. A little ring? A ring. That's for a neck strap. Oh, okay. So if I was going to wear a neck strap, that's you where I would put connect it. Right it. There. But back so to we'll hold so now up here and down here, you can just push them together because they are actually separated. Like this, or there. Yep. Keep going. Okay, so line up the. Mhm. Mm yeah, that's very good. There you go. Because if you um if you put your hand here, and you put this hand up. You can see they like lift into each other. So if I lower, the second I move my hand up here, it raises these. Oh, So okay. if you put your hand down here and up here, when you go to put them together, they don't Then everything, collide. I see, okay. Awesome. And that's how you put it together. And that's how you put together an oboe. So the bell, the lower joint, lower joint the upper the joint. upper joint. And you have to make sure to have the key out of the way so that you don't, Bang the tenon. Really, all you have to do is line up the tenons. Okay, and then you're okay. And try to avoid this little row of screws. Why this little row? Because this is Those the are adjustment screws right here. Ah, okay. And One, we're two, adjusting three, what with the screws? What would we They adjust? will raise the key height. And we would want to do that. Why? If the notes are coming out as a different note, we could go through and change the height of these screws. Gotcha. Like if I was trying to push down these three, and this one wasn't actually playing the correct note, I got you. We can adjust these. How cool is that? So you carry a little jeweler's I have screwdriver a around. Screwdriver. I yeah. see. You just throw it in your case, and then. But I believe that it. these they like to move on their own, so it's uh, best if you don't touch them. I see. Okay. All right. That's how you assemble a Novo. Thank you very much. We'll see you next time. And now, a music history moment. Hey, what's going on? Okay, I'm gonna tell you about Leontine Price. She was born in Laurel, Mississippi. She's an amazing lyrical spinto. Went to Juilliard, but here's something very important about her. She was the first African-American prima donna at the Metropolitan Opera. She debuted with Corelli in 1961 in Il Trovatore. I love her because she's a face that's not represented very often on that stage, and I'm hoping that in the future, we can get to that point. How about that?
let's see. Let me negotiate this part first, because someone will go by too fast, honk at me. Yeah, like, because it's so easy to see around you. Hey, coming through. Yeah. Okay. Got it. Chill out. <laughs> Once was proving that she could pick up a grown man, and she did that and like threw out his back. <laughs> it's pretty funny. That would happen to her. The real question is, what would possess you to want to learn the yoga? Today, on the opening season. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> Ladder key. I get It's key. spelled like it's uh -huh. said. And there's like a capital D. Lydicky. Okay, that's funny. Yeah. How do you even get that out of the Duke? Lydicky? I don't know. Because people. Because <laughs> people. Hey, thanks for watching the show. If you want to reach us with questions or comments, you can figure out all the ways to do that by clicking on any of those links in wherever you're watching this thing. We've had a great time putting these together and hope you find them useful as well. Thanks for watching.